Georgina, it's very interesting indeed to meet with you. Um, and you've had a, a fascinating um, career already. Um, and um, I suppose the, the, the most, if I start us off, I think when we were talking a moment ago, you said that um, you spent some of your youth in Gloucestershire. Is that, is that what you said? Yes. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to do this, Stephen. Um, first of all, uh, yes, I grew up in Gloucestershire, in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. Um, and that's where I went to school. Um, and then I actually went up to York, to the University of York. So tell me, which, 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 um, uh, there's always a marvellous sort of uh, legend about the, for the Forest of Dean still being somewhere that's cut off from the rest of England and they you spend all your time charcoal burning but I don't expect much of that happens now um well I'm not sure it's a <laughs> bit of a no man's land between England and Wales um yeah. I don't think you're considered a true forester unless you've lived there for at least five generations right um, which I haven't done um but it's a what was your nearest town then where was your school uh, in Gloucester I went to Rizal High School in Gloucester. I see, right, yeah. Because there are places like, is it Colford? Yes, yes. So Colford's yeah. one of the largest towns in the Forest of Dean. Yeah. So you spent all of your, your youth, really, in that part of the world? Yes, I did. Yeah. I, um, as I, when I was a child, actually, I was actually born in the United Arab Emirates and then lived in Saudi Arabia uh, with, with my parents, who were both working there. Um, but they moved back to Gloucestershire when I was about seven years old. So I, I grew up there. And that part of uh, Gloucestershire was quite well known, um, I suppose, back in the 1920s, 100 years ago now nearly, for a group of poets, the Dimmock poets. Did you come across them? Yes, I did. Dimmock would probably be about 15 minutes drive from where I grew up. <laughs> well, um, Edward Thomas, who was a great nature poet, of course, um, I think didn't live there, but he, he was part of that group. And Robert Frost, the American poet, um, also uh, was part of that wider circle. So when you went off to university, um, you, you, you did rather an interesting course. Can you describe what it says exactly? Yes, so my undergrad was a BA in writing, directing and performance. Um, and that was within the Department of Theatre, Film and Television at the University of York. And it was a new course, actually, the first year that I that I did it there, that I joined. Um, so we covered everything, really, from the history of film to, uh, gosh, all sorts. We did little modules on Shakespeare. We did film production. So we had TV studios. Um, we had some creative writing modules as well, as well as the analytical side of things. It was a really, really diverse course. God, yeah. And so presumably one of the subjects that you went, went there with was English, was it? Yes, yes, yeah. English, English literature and theatre. Um, yeah, yeah. And are you still an avid reader? I am. Um, I probably average, Honestly, two or th two or three books a week, right. um, but I'll normally split those. I, I actually have a an audio book on the go most of the time, as well as a book that I'm reading, um, and it's mostly novels. But I do read some memoir and nonfiction as well. And who are, uh, do you have any great? I mean, if someone said, you know, what's who are near the top of your pantheon? Who would you put as your great favourites amongst novelists? Gosh, that's a really difficult question. Um, it changes all the time. Um, I grew up reading a lot of a lot of fantasy, um, so I would have to put Tolkien up there. I think he is absolutely fantastic um, and builds worlds like no other, really. Um, who else would be at the top? My gosh. Um, I feel like I have to go to look at my bookshelf to give it No, don't, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to tell and you the wrong people. <laughs> I'll forget. Um, and if it wasn't fantasy, what, who might you be reading then? Um, a lot of historical fiction. Um, I 
read oh gosh you put me on the spot here Stephen I can't think of a single thing to tell you other than Wilbur Smith which is obviously what I read <laughs> we'll, we'll come we'll come we'll around come we'll, to him later. yeah we'll get to him yes don't worry um, um, I've, then, I've, sorry go on no I was gonna say before you got to where you are now which is which will bring us to Wilbur Smith of course you've done a variety of interesting things you were um Tell us about what was the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust? What did that do or does mm. it do? Um, they're, they're actually a fantastic trust. They were set up with an investment from Winston Churchill. Um, and now they fund UK citizens to travel abroad to bring back research that will be of benefit to their community um, that they can't gather in this country. So your community could be... Um, a physical community or it could be an area of work that you're particularly interested in or something that you actually do for for work for your job um, and they'll fund you for up to two months to travel to go and re research the project that you've proposed to them um, so mine that I proposed and was lucky enough to receive a grant for was uh, researching fundraising and philanthropy in the circus arts um, for which I got to travel to North America, um, which was, well, New England plus just up into Canada. Um, and then I also did a month in Australia. And circuses have been something that's really, have really fascinated you. I know because we, we were talking a minute or two before we started about a friend of mine um, whose sister ran a circus. You were saying Nell, Nell Gifford? Yes. Yes. But tell us a bit of what got you into circuses then? Very good question. Um, when I was a lot younger, uh, my cousin could juggle and tiny, tiny me thought that was very, very cool and I, <laughs> I wanted to learn. Um, so I remember him teaching me at a family party um, and then my parents bought me some circus workshops for a birthday present um, when I was, oh gosh, probably about 11. <laughs> Um, and then from there, the woman who ran those workshops, she ran a youth circus in the Forest of Dean. So I started going to that. Um, Nell Gifford, who we, we just mentioned, uh, had a fantastic circus called Gifford Circus that still, still exists and they're still doing fantastic shows, um, surviving even at this time. Uh, and I grew up going to see their shows every summer um, and just fell in love with circus as an art form. I think it has something really special a, a cross between kind of contemporary traditional a cross between theatre fit the physicality of dance or the athletic side that you need to to actually be able to do the skills that they use and presumably we're talking about traveling circuses with big tops are we uh we are but not only um so gifford circus um they do have a tent and they do travel um, but there is a lot of discussion around the difference between traditional and contemporary circus. Um, and Giffords has that wonderful feeling of nostalgia of the traditional circus. But there's also a lot of contemporary circus out there today where you see really what look like ordinary people doing absolutely extraordinary things. So you might see someone in a jeans and a t-shirt who can fly, fly through the air. Um, and you see them a lot more these days now in contemporary circus, really building building a narrative into the shows that they're creating. And I imagine that circuses have changed a good deal since I was a youngster, because in those days, um, things like they had animals in circus, and I think that's now no longer true, is it? Mm, and, and, and also, um, do they still have clowns? They do still have clowns. Oh. Um, there's traditional, very traditional clowning, um, and a lot of the traditional circus. So Giffords have a, a famous a clown called Tweedy the Clown, um, and he's been with them for years, um, and he's hilarious. Um, but you can actually, there are, there, there are clowning schools, clowning courses out there. Um, it's a, it's a very difficult skill. We even have clergy who are clowns, in fact. Uh, one of the most um, well-known ones, very sadly, died, I suppose, 18 months, two years ago, and he was quite young, but yes, they, 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 that was quite good. They come round to clergy conferences and you find suddenly this peculiar tickling going on behind your ear, and so he's got his tickling stick sort of thing. Um, and that, that, but music is another thing, clearly, that really matters a lot to you. Um, 
you're in the Camden Light Orchestra. I am indeed. And um, play the saxophone. I do, yes, I play the alto saxophone. Um, it's actually something that I started learning a few years ago. I grew up playing the piano, so I was lucky enough to already be able to read music, but I'd always wanted to learn the saxophone, play in a band. Um, so I set myself the task of doing that. And Camden Light Orchestra are a fantastic group. We play a lot of big band music, a lot of um, film scores. Um, so it's things that feel really good to play with a, play with a group, big, big group of people. And they're based in Camden, are they in London or? Mm, it's in Kentish yeah. Town that we normally practice. Right. And do, you do you live nearby to that or? Yes, I actually live in, I live in Crouch End in North London. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, well I was at the Stationers Company School, which was just above Crouch End actually. It was sort of on the ridge, the next ridge into London from Alexander Palace. So I know Crou Crouch End uh, well. And um, I see also you um, you did fundraising with it, the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. Mm, I did. That was really my first real foray into fundraising. I was lucky enough to get a place. It was actually an Arts Council funded scheme um, that fast tracked young professionals into fundraising for the arts. And as part of that scheme, you got a year's, a year's worth of training from the Arts Council and you were placed within an organisation somewhere in the UK. Um, and I was placed in, in Bournemouth at Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra um, for a year and it was just an amazing, an amazing experience. <laughs> it, it's been one of the orchestras um, after London uh, in this country that's been one of the most uh, leading sort of, uh, mm. um, is, is that not true? Yes, that's absolutely true. They've yeah. been around, my gosh, I'm I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get the exact date right, I can tell you that, but they, it's over 100 years. Um, and they've got a lot of, a lot of supporters um, in the area and they're also doing some fantastic work, um, particularly within their outreach and participation department. They have a lot of programmes with um, elderly people, people maybe suffering from Alzheimer or dementia um, and actually using music um, to help help support them as well as all of the concerts that they do with their professional musicians. And when you were there who was their um, whatever you call him resident or leading conductor? Conductor it was Kirill Karabitz. And is he still there doing that? Oh I honestly can't tell you but I don't think so. No. <laughs> Did you see have you seen any of the um, uh, Hanover band Beethoven on the um, the station has uh, sponsored. No, I haven't. Oh, you must see it. It's wonderful. I mean, we had the first eight symphonies of uh, Beethoven in his 250th year, mm -hmm. and they were um, recorded uh, in Stationers Hall in August, just before the hall finally closed for the rebuilding and so on. Um, and, um, and during the, not quite lockdown, but uh, they had to be all two meters distance from each other and well you must you do look in it's on YouTube and uh, you go to the Hanover Band because you get um, not only marvellous music but in a tremendously good setting for when you think when it was written and so on mm. and so uh, when did you you got to the Wilbur Smith um, Foundation how long ago four years ago now so that was in 2016 that I started working with them and they're based in London? They are. Um, we have a, a small office here in London. Um, and then Wilbur and Niso, his wife, um, they, they're based between London and Cape Town. Yeah, he was, uh, was he Zimbabwean originally or South African? Or? Um, he's South African. He was born in what was Northern Rhodesia. So now yeah. what is Zambia? Um, yeah. But grew up, he, he grew up on his father's ranch there and then went to school in South Africa. Right, okay. And um, he's been a very successful novelist, hasn't he? He has indeed. Very, very successful. Uh, millions of books published into many, many languages all across the world. His first book was published in 1964, which was When the Lion Feeds, which was one of the, one of the first ones of his that I read. Um, and it just hooked me entirely and that was on a recommendation actually from my dad he said you should you should try Wilbur's books um he writes about 
historical things or predominantly yes um so he has um a few different families um and his books will follow generations of these families through the generations um so for example one of them the courtney family um you could go back to the 1600s with the privateers on the high seas you could go to uh, the Johannesburg Gold Rush, um, and he's actually just written his first children's book um, with Chris Wakeling, his co-author. Um, I actually have a copy, I was prepared, um, oh. which I think you can probably see here. Um, oh. That's Cloudburst, Cloudburst. Smith, um, yeah. with Chris Wakeling. And this, the protagonist in this is 14-year-old Jack Courtney. So that's the latest in the generation of the Courtney family. Now, a good friend of ours, um, uh, she's an unusual person, really, because she began reading science, I think, um, at Oxford and then went on to do a PhD in um, crystallography or something. But thereafter has gone into, um, well, uh, she was at, worked at St Paul's Cathedral for a bit and so on. But her daughter, who's, I think, 13, has just written her second novel. So um, perhaps I ought to put her in touch with you for one of these prizes. You definitely should. Um, we have, I mean, she sounds incredible if she's 13 and writing novels already. That's no mean feat by any means. Um, but we have our flagship programme really is the Wilbur Smith Adventure Writing Prize. Um, and as part of the prize, we have three different awards, one for published authors, one for unpublished authors. And then we also have the author of Tomorrow, which is for young writers who are writing short stories. Um, and to be classified as a young writer, they have to be 21 or under. So she definitely fits the bill. <laughs> she's well in the bracket, isn't she? Yes. OK, well, at the end of this, we'll, I'll put the two of you in touch with each other. Yeah. Um, so... Tell us about the, 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 how did you, because you'd been reading Wilbur Smith, is that what caught you up into getting this post or what? Um, partly, yes. Um, I decided it was time to look for my next step in my career. Um, and I was looking, looking for jobs that I found interesting. And I actually saw a job on the Guardian, uh, Guardian Jobs page. Um, that was for the foundation manager, the Wilbur and Niso Smith Foundation. And I was looking down at all the essentials and the um, desirable skills, thinking this sounds absolutely fantastic. And I clicked through onto the website. And at that point, I had this moment of realisation that the Wilbur they were talking about was Wilbur Smith. <laughs> Um, and my dad is a, is a huge fan of his books. Um, and put me on to, it was actually Birds of Prey was the first of Wilbur's that I read, um, put me on to one of his when I was a, oh, I must have been about 17 or 18. Um, and I absolutely devoured it. Um, so when I had that moment of realisation, um, I was coming at it from being a fan as well as, <laughs> um, as well as it looking like a great, a great career prospect. <laughs> Well, I think this is brilliant, and it makes me feel that um, there must be ways. I mean, you're a freeman of the company, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. We must find some ways in which we can engage other people with the sort of work you're doing. Perhaps we can get you to do uh, uh, to do something for stations one evening, have an evening session of some sort. It may be easier when we get out of this present muddle that we're in, but uh, but that would be really good. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope you're going to go on to be a become a Liveryman too. We need people like you um, really at the heart of the company. I, Is I, there anything you'd yeah. like to see stationers in the light of all we've been talking about, in the light of the work you've done? Hmm. What do you think? Is there, is there anything you'd like to prod stationers into thinking about doing that might relate to your work or your interests? Ooh. I think one of the things that I really love about the stationers company is that there is there is so much experience within within the group of people um, that I feel like if if there's ever anything that I need um, advice about or opinions on, um, there is someone there that will will be able to help. And I wonder if it would be possible to 
kind of formalize almost like a mentoring between the younger stationers and the rest of the rest of the company. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea, a brilliant idea. Um, and there is something of that already going on. And uh, we obviously haven't been doing as well as we might in letting people know that, Georgina, but it's mainly been so far the old mentoring the young. My conversation with you makes me say we really need to have many of the younger people mentoring us um, older, more senior people, because we've got huge amounts to learn about things we don't really know about at present. <laughs> Georgina, it's marvellous. Thank you so much for giving us this time and uh, being so inspiring and enlivening. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>